Now I want to talk about evolution, okay? Because that's where things really get interesting. So I'm making a contention that as far as anybody can tell, by any reasonable application of logical thought, it appears that DNA had to have been designed, okay? So we start with a single cell, let's presume, and that happened, you know, billions of years ago, perhaps. And here we have human beings and giraffes and antelopes and camels and bacteria and everything else. How did we get all that stuff? Okay? So I call this a Christian and an atheist go to the zoo. Now, if you got a Christian and an atheist, you don't need a zoo. You can just watch them, and it's more entertaining than the animals. Okay? But here's how I like to frame the question. Did the antelope evolve into a giraffe? Or could, have, could, could the antelope have evolved into a giraffe? If the trees were tall and its neck needed to be longer, could the, could the DNA that describes that neck have mutated and changed to a point where the neck goes from being this long to being this long, and now it can reach the trees, and now it can eat, and now it can survive, and it's more fit, and all of that. Could that have happened? Okay? Um, you know, people get really antsy if you want to talk about, you know, chimpanzees and monkeys turning into humans, but nobody seems to get particularly bent out of shape about antelopes evolving into giraffes, so let's, let's consider that question. Okay, now, if, if, if you get into this particular argument, what you end up with is a whole lot of anecdotal evidence. Okay? What you end up with is, well, see all these fossils? See, you arrange them like this, and they tell this story. And then somebody comes along and goes, no, you idiot. They don't tell this story. They tell that story. No, you idiot. They don't tell this story. They tell that story. And those of us who are in highly rigorous disciplines where we're accustomed to clear black and white answers, do not find those arguments to be particularly useful or satisfying. They just make good copy for the editorial page in the newspaper, but they don't get anybody to any kind of an answer. Okay? And when I got pulled into this conversation, I noticed this right away. Why are these arguments so flimsy? Maybe they're right, but they haven't proven anything to me. Okay, and I've I've been in a number of professions, I've been in a number of disciplines, and I've kind of learned when to tell when people are blowing smoke. Okay, and I was frankly I was very disappointed with most of the creationist books. I was very disappointed with most of the evolutionist books, and most of it was just like I said a bunch of anecdotal evidence. So I'm going to get to a different level with this today. And we have to reduce the question to first principles. Now, if you want to reduce traditional Darwinian theory or neo-Darwinism, let's say, to its most elemental statement, it's this. Random mutation of DNA plus natural selection plus time equals design. Okay? That's the formula of traditional Darwinian evolution. Okay? Now, let me mention here that, just to kind of prep you, there's other ways of understanding evolution besides this one. And they don't get talked about very much. And we're going to get into a different way of looking at this. But this is the Darwinian orthodoxy. This is what you find in virtually any biology book this is the theory that's being defended in all of the newspaper articles and magazine articles and everything. Random mutation, in other words, I got an organism and it reproduces and it makes a whole bunch of other ones and in the reproduction process there, there are tiny errors, copying errors, transcription errors in the DNA. Most of those are probably bad but some of them are good and then the better ones create a more fit organism and natural selection and the competition of the race of life, the winners win, the losers lose, and we get better and better and better and better organisms. Okay? That's what's being said. Okay? And all you need is enough time and it will happen. Well, 
I would like to take take that concept and apply it to a more familiar place. Okay, now, Google advertising. Is there anybody in the world who has not done a search on Google? And is there anybody in the world that hasn't seen a little ad like the ones you see over on the right side? Okay, that is my specialty as a consultant. Okay, if you go to Borders or Barnes and Noble down the street here and you want to find a book on how to advertise in Google, you will probably find mine. It's called The Ultimate Guide to to Google AdWords. It was published in November of 2006 by Entrepreneur Press. It's about 300 pages and explains the whole thing. Okay, and I would contend that Google's advertising system is a consummate example of Darwinism, okay? And here's what, uh, and just a little explanation. The stuff you see on the left, those are not ads. Those are free search engine listings. That's called the organic side of Google. On the right side are the ads, and those are paid for. And when you click on one of those ads, the person who's advertising gets charged for that click. They might get charged five cents or 50 cents or five dollars. It depends on where the bids are for that keyword. Okay, but in the Google system, popular ads move up and get rewarded, and unpopular ads move down. And if you write an ad and it's not popular, it'll move down, and if you want it to move back up, you have to pay more money. Okay, if you write a popular ad, it'll move up and you can pay less money. Okay, isn't that sort of Darwinian? A little bit. You know, the cream rises to the top. The winners win, the losers lose. So that's how that works. And so I want, I want you to consider if the traditional Darwinian model is what's really going on when somebody advertises. So I want to show, I want to show you an example. Okay? This is a real business, a real ad. It's an example. It's in one of my books. Simple self-defense for ordinary people. Easy personal protection training. TFTgroup.com. Now, the one on the left, one on the right, what's the difference between those two ads? It's easy versus fast. Now, when you when you are a Google advertiser, you can actually write both ads and you can test them. Do you think the word easy versus the word fast might make a difference in whether people want to click on the ad? Actually, it makes a great deal of difference. I'll show you. The one on the left, 0.8%. The one on the right, 1.3%. Which means the one on the right is actually about 50% better. Which means the one on the right, um, the, the, the one on the left, another way of putting it, is you can get the same number of clicks for about a third less money if you have the better ad. The one word makes that much difference. Okay? And that's how that's basically in essence how you evolve an advertising campaign is you keep testing and experimenting and you find the sweet spot of what people really like to click on and that's how you make money on Google. Okay? So here's what I did. I hired a programmer and he wrote me a little web program. You can go to randommutation.com and what what this program does is any text that you paste into it it mutates it for you, okay? And it's, it's a little sophisticated. You can even decide if you want to mutate the letters or if you want to mutate the ones and zeros in the ASCII code. So you can, you can pick text or binary. But what happens is you press the button and you can mutate the text, okay? Now, why, why is this an important experiment? Because the traditional Darwinian model says Evolution is a process of random mutation filtered by natural selection. So let's do an experiment. Let's take this Google ad. Can random mutation write a better Google ad? Let's see. Well, after one mutation, do you see what happened? An I turned into a zero. Okay, after five mutations, simple self defense for ordinary people, easy personal protective training, okay, and the more mutations there 